Let's pray for God's help to make that clear. Let's pray. Father God, we do pray as we open your word now, Father, speak to us. Help us to understand um, some of the things that we'll look at this morning. They're, they're difficult for us to get our heads around. Other things are just really horrific. Father, help us um, to sit under your word and to help us know what you would have us learn. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fourteen years ago, my housemate tried to poison me. I know he tried to poison me because he accidentally poisoned himself. He promised me a feast of enchiladas. But as he was cooking it, he put so much salt in those enchiladas. I have no idea to this day how he even managed to get so much in that they were completely inedible. I say they were completely inedible. Still, he managed to eat his own and then he ate the ones that he'd given to me as well. So much so that actually he was ill for several days afterwards with salt poisoning. That was not a feast that I wanted to be part of. Well, in this section of Revelation, we've been seeing the tale of humanity being told as a tale of two cities. Babylon, as, uh, as we've seen, and then uh, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, as a city yet to come, and still to come in the book of Revelation. And this week, the story is being told of a tale of two feasts, of two suppers. One that you definitely wouldn't want to be a part of, and one that you definitely would. And just as the, set, the destinies of those cities were very different, so the outcome of these feasts could not be more different. One spells life, and the other spells death. Well, we've got a lot to get through, so we'll deal with our first point. My words will be shutting the door at the back as well, just to keep the heat in. If somebody could just grab the door at the back and close, that'd be great. So first of all, we start with the response of the redeemed. Let me have a look at verses 1 onwards just for a little bit. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitutes who corrupted the earth with her immorality, and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Really this section here from 1 to 10 uh, starts to uh, finish off what we uh, looked at last week and it sort of feeds into our passage this week it's sort of a bridge between the two Babylon we see there the world seen as a seductress of the saints has fallen in one day, in one hour she has gone and heaven's response is verse 1 hallelujah hallelujah, that's Hebrew for praise the Lord Hallelujah, God has done what is right and true. He has avenged the blood of his people by bringing judgment on Babylon. And he goes on, hallelujah, her smoke rises forever. That picture there is a bit like Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament, when the smoke rose to heaven, gone for good. And God's people represented by 24 elders and the whole of creation represented by four living creatures reply, Amen. Amen, hallelujah. It sounds like one of those sort of meetings you see on the TV in America, doesn't it, where they're all sort of shouting out. They're shouting out, hallelujah. It's over. It's done. All that we've been groaning for, all that we've been longing for is coming to pass. And they worship God. And as if to encourage them, a voice from the throne comes calling all his servants, great and small, to praise him. Do you see that in verse 5? Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. And that's what they do. They start to praise God in the light of what they've seen. John gets a bit carried away later on in verse 10 and almost starts worshipping an angel. But no, it's being told there to worship and praise God. Now verse 6 doesn't tell us whether it's the angels or the elders or the living creatures. Probably it's the idea that everyone joins in with this. It's a noise as loud as thunder or at the foot of a waterfall. Hallelujah! There in verse 6. Why? For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. That's what they're praising God for. That he reigns. He is in control. He has brought this to pass. Hallelujah, they say. Why? Because the wedding supper of the Lamb is here. The engagement will soon be over. The bride is now ready. And if you see there in verse 8, she's even got her dress. 
It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Now, when I got married to Caroline, I thought her dress was lovely on the day. I'm not just saying that. I genuinely thought it was. But it pales in comparison with this one here. Here is the bride of Christ, wearing the righteous deeds of the saints. Do you see that? For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. That's what makes up that dress on that day. All the good works done by Christians, all the time we brought glory to God, will make that dress shine bright like pure linen. <coughs> now, Revelation, bits of Revelation are hard, aren't they? We've been seeing that, but this is an easy bit. We know what we're talking about here, don't we, as we talk about a bride with her dress. We're used to these images and pictures. The lamb is Jesus, and the bride is the church. It's the picture that launched a thousand wedding sermons, isn't it? Uh, if you've been through those, I've been, that makes it sound like it's a, uh, an ordeal. If you've been to those, but it reappears in Ephesians 5, that picture. It reappears in Revelation 21. And Jesus uses that picture of a wedding and a banquet again and again and again in the parables. He even calls himself the bridegroom in the Gospels. And in that sense, in a way, biblically, it's like at the moment we're engaged to Christ. An engagement in those days, though, was a much bigger deal in the Bible than it is for us, perhaps. You'd have to get a divorce from an engagement in the Bible, a la Joseph, you know, who had it in mind to divorce her quietly, even though they actually weren't yet married. You'd have to get a divorce from their engagement. So it's something that's binding, but it's not yet consummated. We're secure in his love and faithfulness, but we await the public celebration, the public revealing of his love towards us. And in many ways, that's what the second coming is. A public revealing, an unveiling of what's already true. The work was done by Jesus in the first coming. His death on the cross to rescue us. His defeat of evil on the cross when he triumphed over the world, the flesh and the devil. But this is what happens now at the end when he returns and everyone will see that publicly. It will be seen and acknowledged. On that day he will acknowledge his covenant love for us and there will be a huge celebration. That in one sense, that celebration will last on into eternity as we spend the rest of forever with him. And we in verse 9 are invited. Do you see that? Right, there's blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There are seven blessings given in the book of Revelation. This is one of them. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it's not just that we're going to the ceremony. We're going to the reception as well. We're going to the banquet, the supper, the after party. And many, many people down through the years have linked this back to Isaiah 25, the Messianic banquet. Listen to this from Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over the nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all their faces, and the reproach of his people will be taken away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Sounds a bit like a wedding banquet, doesn't it? Sounds a bit like a wedding reception. Sounds like a feast, uh, a feast fit for a king, which is really what you're supposed to do, isn't it, for, for a wedding reception? It's a glad and joyous day when we will enjoy a great wedding feast with the Lord Jesus, the Lamb. Wouldn't that be good? There will feast forever in a honeymoon that never ends. More to follow in chapter 21. But before we can get there, there's other things that need sorting out. And so the camera angle changes in Revelation away from the romantic wedding film with the white dress to more of a sort of action film with a rider on a white horse. That's what we see next. Have a look at verses 11 to 16. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flaming fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. 
and the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, bright white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now this section, as the camera angle moves, it starts with heaven being opened, which if you've been with us for the series in Revelation, it's an ominous sign. That glimpse back to heaven occurs at the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and with the seven bowls of God's wrath. Something terrible is about to happen. It's a clue that we're really the end of the end. That's what's in mind. And a rider comes forth out of heaven on a white horse. And here's a spoiler alert. It's Jesus. There are many, many things that are disputed in the book of Revelation. Believe me, I've been reading commentaries for weeks. This one is about the only place, I think, in the whole thing where everybody agrees. This is Jesus. The description leaves us in no doubt as to who this is talking about. Plus, the angel tells John the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of all prophecy. Prophecy at its heart is there to prophesy about Jesus, is there to tell us about him. And in all that confusion and trickiness, it's easy to forget that, isn't it? That actually, this is about Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 1. And as though to give us a worked example, he testifies to the Lord Jesus through prophecy. In other words, he tells us some things about the Lord Jesus, but in this sort of revelation, apocalyptic language. And really, he tells us three big things through his description. Firstly, he tells us the names of Jesus. There's several here. Not just Lord or Christ, but he tells us that he's called faithful and true. He's dependable, trustworthy. He's honourable and sincere. In Revelation 3 verse 14, he's called a faithful and true witness. In other words, he did not give in, even when he was sent to the cross. He also tells us he's called the Word of God. Now that's not just a little plug for his own gospel, because John is the one that calls him the Word of God, right at the beginning of, of John. But more than that, it's consistent with how Scripture presents Jesus as the revealer of the Father, as the one by whom the Father acts, the one by whom the Father organises the world, and the one by whom judgment comes. So he's the Word of God. He also tells us that he has a name that no one else knows. And again, we've already met this idea in Revelation. In Revelation 2.17, the church in Pergamon were told that they would be given a new name, which no one else would know. When we looked at that then, we said it was to do with control. In the ancient world, they believed that if you knew someone's name, you could curse them, you could control them. But no one knows his name. In other words, no one can control this Jesus. No one can curse him. He's above all that authority. And he tells us, finally, the final name, that on his robe and on his thigh he has written on it, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's got clothing with writing on to identify. You still see it today, don't you, with people with sort of things written on their back as they go around. Thighs, less, less so much people don't generally write their names on their thighs. Many different reasons given. It's where the swords are. It's where you can see when he's sat on the horse. But thankfully the point is not so much where it's written, but what is written. King of kings, Lord of lords. This is he who is, none is greater than him. No one is higher. And this is who he is today, isn't he? He is king of kings. He is lord of lords. But one day, everybody will see it. One day, everyone will acknowledge it. So those are his names. Secondly, he tells us what he's wearing and what he looks like. He tells us that he has many diadems on his head. Now, when I first read this, I'll be honest with you, I thought it was a mistake. I thought it was going to be one of those ones where you look into it and it doesn't really mean diadems. Jesus and his followers in Revelation aren't pictured wearing them. It's generally the bad guys. We defined diadems before as a sort of showy crown. It's the one that you see with all the sort of jewels on and everything. The dragon wore seven, completely showy. Jesus and his followers, though, usually wear something else. It's called a stephanos, which is a victor's crown. And that was a sort of lower key affair. And I thought, oh, when I look at it, I bet it'll be that that he's wearing. But it's not, it's diadems. 
And I think the reason is, it's to show us that if, if the Stephanos is a sort of low-key version, that there is nothing low-key about what's going on. When Jesus returns, he will return in glory and in power. There'll be no disputing his kingly power. It will be visible to all. You will be able to see it, if you like, through how he looks. He tells us that he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. The saints were told that they had washed their clothes in the blood and made them clean. But here there's no need for his clothes to be clean because he's already pure and holy. But the blood is a reminder that he is the lamb who was slain. With his blood he has purchased men and women for God. So we see it even in his clothes. It's a reminder of his death on that day. He tells us that his eyes are like flames of fire. That's from Daniel's vision of a man in Daniel 10. And was mentioned back in the vision of Jesus in the opening chapter. Back then we said it's like he's got laser vision. Burning eyes, all seeing. Nothing is hidden from his gaze. He knows all. He sees all. <coughs> And therefore there's no hiding from this Jesus. And then linked with that, the third thing that he tells us about Jesus is that he's coming back to judge. He tells us that he judges and makes war in righteousness. Jesus is the righteous judge. He is the conqueror in the one and only true just war, if you like. He comes here to bring judgment on the nations. And when he does, it says he'll come with an accompanying army. Jesus is not alone on that day. There's an army with him dressed similarly to him. The army of heaven, the host of heaven. We forget often that when we talk about host in the Bible, it's a, it's a military term. It's talking about armies. Something the saints are included here too, especially since the bride is clothed in fine linen and in verse 8, so are the army. But we're certainly told in, that the angels and uh, will come with him on that day in Mark 14, sorry, Mark 8 and Jude 14. So it might be just everybody with him. He tells us that he will strike down the nations with the sword of his mouth. Again, this is a picture that goes back to the chapter 1, but it's also from the Old Testament, from Isaiah 11. It says, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. So we see here when Jesus comes, there's no actual battle. He just speaks his powerful word and they perish. His word is so powerful. And he tells us that he will rule with a rod of iron. A reference back to Psalm 2, where we're told that God's anointed will dash the nations to pieces like clay pots. Pretty horrific imagery, isn't it, as Jesus returns? It gets even worse. There's one more thing in judgment. He tells us that he will tread the winepress of God's wrath. Now, that's not a reference back to the cross where Jesus took God's wrath, but a reference forward to judgment here. And if you think about it, it's very similar to the imagery we saw in chapter 14 of the horrific harvest where the winepress of God's wrath was trod and produced a river of blood that was longer than the River Jordan. But here, the horrific thing we see is Jesus is treading it. And I don't think we're used to seeing Jesus this way, are we? We're used to Jesus meek and mild. We're not used to him riding on a white horse and striking down his enemies. But we must remember that Jesus is the judge. And for example, we're told in chapter 6 that the people were to hide themselves on that day from the wrath of the Lamb. It almost seems like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? But we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that only God the Father is angry at sin. Jesus is angry at sin too. And here, Jesus is the one who brings the judgment. We shouldn't try and play off the personalities or the persons of the Trinity. As though they sort of have different agendas. There are different persons in the Godhead, but their character and their goal is the same. Yes, for us, being a person means we have different personalities with different quirks and, and character traits. But that's not the case with the Trinity. They're different persons, but they have different personalities. That's why to know Jesus is to know God the Father. And together they judge. They're there together in that. 
And we're told that Jesus will return as judge and bring justice. And that's what we see in the last section. If you thought that was horrific, it gets even worse. A different supper. Verses 17 to 21. Let me read them to you again. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice he called to the birds that fly directly overhead. Come gather for the great supper of God. To eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with all their armies gathered to make war against him, who sits, is sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulphur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. <clears throat> what follows is a pretty horrific account of the end. In this section of Revelation, we get three visions of the end in very quick succession. We've already had the fall of Babylon, the seducer of the church. Here we see the fall of the beasts, the persecutors of the church. And then next week we'll see the fall of Satan, the enemy behind it all. But I don't think we're supposed to see these as a succession in time. As though Babylon falls and then the beast falls and then Satan falls. We're to read this as three takes on the same event. Judgment day, the day of the Lord. I'll explain more as we go through. But here we see the two beasts that we saw back in chapter 13. Here they're called the beast and the false prophet, but clearly it's those two that are in mind. In chapter 13 we define them as the secular and religious authorities that persecute Christians. Beasts that have had many faces down through the ages. But here we see them finally thrown into the lake of fire. Babylon ended with fire, the beasts end with fire, and the devil will end in fire as well. Not to be destroyed, but to be tormented for eternity. We see that in uh, Revelation 20 verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulphur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is a truly horrific end, isn't it? thrown alive into the lake of fire as though to add to the horror of it. But what it's really saying there at that point is that there is one day when not only the seduction will end, but the persecution of believers will end. In our world we see it, don't we, in the news. We've seen it this week with Christians being killed around the world. But he's saying in the world to come there'll be no beasts breathing down our necks. There'll be no authorities threatening Christians with death if they share their faith. There'll be no authorities trying to force Christians to go against their consciences and bow down to something other than the true God. There'll be no persecution. That will be done with. The beast will be gone, never to trouble God's people again. But not just the beast, though. We see here those who have followed the beast. They must be dealt with, too. Now this bit truly is horrific, but as a church we don't pick and choose which bits of the Bible we do and don't look at. This is horrific, but it's there, so that's what we're going to look at. What we see in verses 18 and 21 are really a repeat of the horrible harvest of chapter 14, but from a different angle. The word of Christ slays all the people who have opposed Christ and his people. It kills them, dead. And the birds of the air are called to feast on their corpses. All men and women, slave and free, great and small, all are slain. There are no survivors. They have made their choice to oppose Christ, to live in rebellion against him, and now they must face the consequences, which is what we see. Jesus is returning as judge, and all those who did not heed the call to repent will perish. And this is the other feast that we have here, when the birds are called down to feast on the bodies of the slain, a supper for the birds. And the image is parallel to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And really the message is this, you can come to the feast, or you can be the feast. Which are you going to choose? There is no middle ground. Which would you rather do or be? And it sounds horrific, but to many of the first readers this would have been an encouragement. Many who were facing terrible persecution. Those who had had their compatriots killed. Those who had been driven from their homes and their places of worship. Those who had been refused a living and had their property stolen. What it's saying here is that one day justice will come. One day the wrongs will be righted, eternally so, as we'll see in the coming chapters. And we see here that the very creation itself joins in on the judgment, as the birds feast on the flesh of the fallen. The imagery here is taken from Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel there is told that the bird, to call the birds of the air to eat the flesh of the fallen army of Gog and Magog. In Revelation, though, Gog and Magog, whatever you or whoever you take them to be, they fall in the next chapter. It's a clue again that it's not in chronological order, one after the other, but three accounts of the same day, that same time. But whatever you think about the order, it's horrific, isn't it, what's going on? That's why we had the children leave before the reading this morning. It's good for them that, to hear the Bible together, isn't it, for the children to know what we're looking at. But we don't want to give them nightmares, do we? And this is the stuff of nightmares. It's not a case of turn to Jesus and your life will be better and easier. It's not a case of turn to Jesus, or if you don't, you know, that's fine. Here it's turn to Jesus or face the alternative, which we see here is judgment. It's eat supper or be supper. And you can view that negatively like a threat. Although God is judge, isn't he? Is it wrong to have prison and fines as a threat to deter those who would commit crime? Is it wrong for a parent to spell out the consequences for if their child does wrong to stop them from doing wrong? God, after all, is the legitimate authority and he's warning us in advance where our actions will lead. It's like those shocking warnings on cigarette packets. This will be the outcome if you continue on the path you're on. To be honest here, it's there as a warning, isn't it? And if the person carries on, they are free to do so, but on their own head be it. They've been warned. So you can view it like a threat, but actually there are some threats that are there to be helpful, aren't they? Or you can view this more positively, you can view it as an incentive. God makes the alternative shockingly awful, so that we have no good excuse not to turn to Christ. It's not two happy endings, if you like, it's just one. So there's no good reason not to turn to Christ, especially given the alternative. I mean, humanly speaking, why wouldn't you turn to God in light of this? We have no excuse not to, if we understand this correctly. And even if being a Christian was awful, which I'm not saying it is, but it's hard, isn't it? But even if it was awful, wouldn't it be better than that horrific end? In the tale of two feasts, wouldn't you prefer to be part of the one that doesn't poison or kill you? Whatever that other meal might be. Let me finish by a story by a guy called Ray Comfort, an American evangelist. He, he puts it this way. He says, imagine that you're on a plane on the way to a lovely holiday in Spain. And someone comes up to you on the plane and they say, you need to put on a parachute. And you quite, ask the, quite rightly ask, why? And they tell you, well, look, it will enhance your in-flight experience. It'll be great. All the cool people, all the influencers are wearing them. You'll be surprised how comfortable your parachute is. It'll make your journey so much better. So you put on your parachute, and the other people on the plane start to laugh and make fun of you. You just can't get comfortable in your seat. It's bad enough normally, isn't it? Let's face it. It's just so difficult to carry on that in the end, you take off your parachute. Oh, and unexpectedly the plane crashes, and you perish. Okay, same scenario. You're on a plane on the way to Spain. Someone comes up to you and says, you need to put on a parachute. Again, you ask, why? And they tell you that the plane has got an engine problem, and will certainly crash. They tell you that the parachute is uncomfortable, that people will scoff at you wearing one. But when the plane goes down, you can jump to safety. 
And that's what happens. You put on the parachute, people start to laugh, but you keep remembering what's coming. It's uncomfortable on the plane, but you keep wearing it because you keep your eyes on what's going to happen in the future. Again, the plane crashes, but because you know what will happen, you have clung onto your parachutes and you make it to safety. And that's what John wants here for his readers. That's what God wants us who hear these words to do. Yes, what's being described is horrific, but it gives us good cause to cling to our salvation. It gives us good cause to persevere to the end. To cling to Christ, the Lamb, our bridegroom, even when it's hard. And it causes us to look forward to that day, doesn't it? When there'll be no beast, there'll be no Babylon. And as next time, we'll see no Beelzebub. But let's pray for now for the strength to keep going. And it's hard, isn't it? But let's keep praying for that strength, keep praying to keep our eyes on the end and look forward, not just to the bad things, but to that wonderful wedding supper of the Lamb. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that you would help us this morning as we have, have looked at difficult things. Father, we will have people in our minds. We'll have situations in our minds. Father, help us to keep turning to you. Help us to keep finding our comfort in you. And Father, keep us going until that last day. Father, keep us trusting in you. Help us not to turn away. But Father, keep us trusting in the Lord Jesus and looking forward to that great wedding feast of the Lamb. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.